Good afternoon, and thank you for attending today's webinar on airflow measurement presented by Ruskin product experts, Spencer Brinkmeyer, Ray Laramore, and Glenn Esser. The webinar will be approximately 45 minutes followed by a Q&A session. If you have any questions during the webinar, please use the box with the question mark in the upper right corner of your screen. All questions will remain anonymous and will only be seen by the presenter. If we do not get to all questions, I will send out the answers in an email following this presentation. After the webinar concludes, you will receive a certificate of attendance, a link to the video of this presentation, and a link to register for next week's webinar on Louver products presented by Ruskin product experts, Jay Ram Kumar, Joe Rockhold, and Cody Jakes. Thank you again for attending, and now I'll turn it over to Spencer Brinkmeyer to begin the presentation. Appreciate it, Emma. Uh, I'd like to second Emma's welcome and thank you for tuning into this latest installment of the Ruskin webinar series. Today's topic is covering airflow measurement considerations in today's buildings. Uh, and as we all know, air quality has gained a lot more attention in 2020 than in past years uh, due to the ongoing global COVID-19 pandemic. However, schools, if you haven't heard, are getting back in session and hospitals are now performing elective surgeries again. So it's now more important than ever that we design facilities that can maintain proper ventilation. However, the only way to control airflow is to be able to measure airflow. And the most reliable solution to effective ventilation is to measure airflow through your building. So today myself, Ray Laramore and Glenn Esser are going to detail the importance of airflow measurement and also identify which air measuring systems are suitable in a variety of applications. We're going to do this uh, by covering some common air measuring terms. Uh, discuss the importance of air measuring specifically relating to codes and standards, identify correct sizing and placement of air measuring stations, and look at why air measuring outside air is so difficult, uh, and then finish by looking on how to select the correct air measuring product for your specific application. You'll hear us refer to a, a few common, you know, crutch terms uh, or definitions throughout this discussion. So to get a few of the basic ones out there, uh, I want to start with air velocity, which is simply defined as the speed of air measured in feet per minute. Uh, and we use that air velocity to calculate air flow, which is the volume of air in cubic feet per minute through uh, through an opening. And then the two main types of airflow measuring systems that you'll hear us discuss today are velocity pressure and electronic. Velocity pressure measures the difference in air pressure before and after a sensor to determine its air velocity. Uh, and the most common example of this is a simple pitot tube. Uh, electronic air measuring is a slightly newer technology and it uses thermal dispersion sensing thermistors. It's a mouthful there, uh, but Glenn will discuss more at length uh, some electronic air measuring types. Uh, finally, where controlling ventilation is the primary function of air measuring equipment. Uh, without maintaining proper ventilation, our buildings are susceptible to what we call sick building syndrome and even the spread of COVID. If you listened to our webinar a couple weeks ago on COVID considerations, you likely heard us discussing sick building syndrome when we noted that the solution to pollution is dilution. And without proper ventilation in your occupied spaces, there can be bacterial growth like mold and other funguses that develop and the development of these bacteria can lead to sick occupants over time, which is what we are all trying to avoid. Thankfully, uh, ASHRAE has already done a lot of the hard work over many years, and they have come to provide us some guidance on how to design uh, airflow measurement and, and, and specifically minimum ventilation rates in various occupancies. Uh, so ASHRAE 62.1 specifically is the accepted method of determining minimum fresh air requirements. So the table that you see in front of you here uh, is pulled from ASHRAE and details the minimum ventilation rates and breathing zones for vari various occupancy categories. What's not shown here, uh, this is a much larger table and there's, there's various tables in ASHRAE. Uh, so what's not shown here are some of the minimum ventilation rates for rooms that require even more airflow uh, such as your gyms and your hospitals. Uh, but these, as I mentioned, can be found in other tables within the ASHRAE standards. Uh, it should also be noted, you know, if you look at this table here, uh, the minimum CFF, CFM shown is per occupant and also takes into account your building square footage. 
so if you're designing a break room, for instance, you see that first line there under office buildings, uh, the minimum ventilation is going to be much higher than five CFM per person uh, based on that space's maximum occupancy um, of people. So now we want to talk airflow. When we talk airflow, we're trying to identify the volume of air measured in cubic feet per minute or CFM. Uh, and the calculation for this is very simple. So hopefully uh, a lot of this is re review, uh, but we simply are multiplying the air velocity measured by your air measuring station uh, times the square foot area of the opening through which the air is passing. Uh, so this square foot area could be a duct size, it could be a louver section, uh, it could be an air handling opening, um, but the calculation for airflow is simply, you know, velocity times your area there. Uh, I'm going to pass it off to Ray and let her discuss uh, some air measuring placement guidelines and also uh, some of the challenges that face us when we're trying to measure outside air. Yeah, thanks Spencer. So, well, the basic math that Spencer just showed you can be useful in design considerations with these re re regards to factors like sizing for airflow. Uh, another design consideration is where you place one of these devices. Airflow devices require laminar airflow to read accurately, which is a function of physics based on obstructions in your duct and measured in equivalent duct diameters. Here you can see examples of what that looks like for velocity pressure devices for various types of elbows. You can also see here that in the case of limited space, it may be a good idea to consider different designs like veined elbow over unveined to help provide laminar airflow more efficiently. This is of such vital importance in getting an accurate reading that we offer guides on our website in each of our installation instructions, as well as an online tool that can be used to determine how acceptable a location is. Electronic devices are often used in areas where you have less space to work with as they require slightly less straight duct run. Glenn will view these technology types with you more closely later in the presentation. Please note that with electric devices, your electronic devices, you're going, you're using an average number of sensing points. And while there's no way to make a bad location good, more points to take an average from can make any bad location at least slightly better. If you'd like to take a closer look at device placement after this presentation, <clears throat> I recommend going to our website and working with our air measurement placement guideline. So, taking a look at duct locations in your building, you may see air measuring devices in a wide variety of locations, such as supply and return air. You may find them combined with louvers and wall openings or at fan inlets in the form of piezometric rings or sensors placed in the inlet, or you might find them in ductwork throughout the building. One of the most common locations is going to be at outside air openings. That's because devices are often used to ensure that enough fresh air is being brought into a space without being wasteful. On that note, let's dive into outside air. Measuring it comes with challenges, but hopefully we can help you to overcome them. So to do this, let's use a typical air handler as an example. As a general rule of thumb, outside air openings are sized to be large enough to prevent moisture carryover and provide 100% outside air. So with a supply air rating of 500 feet per minute and a 25,000 CFM fan, we would end up with a 50, foot, 50 square foot outside air opening. Now looking at these values, let's discuss measuring them. One method for outside air to be measured by using by using supply and return air. But the large volumes being measured actually end up almost guaranteeing an accuracy in, reading, in your reading based on the uncertainty involved. At a 5% inaccuracy with a 25,000 CFM fan and a 22,500 CFM return air, you end up with a certain uncertainty almost as high as the air you're actually measuring. Instead, you could supply direct air measurement at the outside air intake and greatly decrease your uncertainty. That's not to say that direct air measurement doesn't have its own challenges. Most air measuring stations are able to read airflow in either direction. In our example of an air handling unit, you can see that you actually run the risk of cross flow from the return air being picked up by the station and then throwing off your reading. It's important to keep these design considerations like this in mind and to plan the placement of your air measurement device and to protect it 
from factors like this that may cause turbulent airflow. Um, for example, I've seen people actually use sheet metal or things like that to direct air away from it or to protect their air measuring device. For outside air, you also need to consider the environment it's being placed in. Typical wind speeds in the US are around 11 miles per hour or just under 1,000 feet per minute. I'm sure that anyone that's ever had to do work on a rooftop is also aware that you're, the higher you are, the greater the wind speed generally is. Often outside air openings are relatively exposed to these high wind speeds. Looking back at our air handling unit, we now have to think about protecting the air measuring device from these environmental factors so they can cause inaccurate readings. Thinking about how you design your hood and how far back your air measuring station is placed matters. I'll also add that a station with a fully closed damper can have a flow reading if it has something like wind blowing across it, the air across the air measuring device, despite the fact that you clearly aren't bringing in any air at that time. Now let's take a look at one last outside air measuring option with economizers. As stated, the outside air opening is often sized for the maximum airflow. Sometimes you'll see this opening divided into two sections, a minimum section with air measuring to ensure that at least the minimum airflow, required airflow is being supplied. And then the rest of the opening is filled with another damper, damper that will open to increase the airflow as necessary. Whether you divide the opening or not, it's important to make sure that your device has the most laminar airflow possible and to use direct measurement whenever possible. Now I'll pass you on to Glenn and he can take you through our air measuring product types. Thank you, Ray. Hello, I'm Glenn Esser and I've been asked to talk about types and methods of air measurement, comparison of different methods, and various outdoor air measurement applications, which as Ray explained are some of the most challenging applications. Selecting the right product for the application is key to the success. Electronic or properly applied velocity pressure air measurement devices can be equally accurate. And in general, electronic works best for lower velocities and large openings and velocity pressure or electronic can either be applied for higher velocity applications. Airflow measurement using velocity pressure um, we've got a velocity of say 300 feet per minute uh, would create a vo velocity pressure of uh, one one hundredth of an inch of water column. Uh, point zero 0.01 is also equal to the uncertainty of a one inch transducer uh, with one percent accuracy. So the air measurement and the uncertainty on that air measurement are the same thing. In this velocity range, a transducer sized correctly with less uncertainty might be a good idea, like our AMS 8100LR with plus or minus 5% uncertainty. Unlike electronic air measurement devices, velocity pressure will only measure airflow flowing in one direction through the plane of the air measurement device. Velocity pressure, when paired with a deadhead transducer, is more tolerant of dirt. A deadhead transducer has a diaphragm between the high and the low pressure ports and no air flows through the transducer or the measurement device. And this type of device can work for years with little or often no maintenance and only dirt buildup on the outside of it. Some transducers are flow through type and combine thermal dispersion or a bleed of airflow through the sensor to arrive at a pressure measurement. A bleed type transducer has air flowing in the high pressure port and out the low pressure port. Dirt can get inside and clog up the works, making velocity pressure then less tolerant of dirt. Ruskin only uses deadhead transducers with our air measurement devices. Airflow measurement in HVA, HVA systems. There are different types of air measurement devices used in the heating, ventilation, air conditioning systems and handheld testing devices are typically applied when your test and balance contractors are on site. <clears throat> We've got duct mounted uh, probes, duct mounted air measurement stations, uh, fan inlet air measurement stations using pickup ports in the fans inlet bill or aftermarket energy robbing add on devices that span the fans opening. Pressure drop across a fixed or variable opening is also another method. 
and air measurement louvers using high velocity through the wind-driven rain louver is another method. When we're talking about types and methods of airflow measurement, the calibrated orifice plate is a method of transferring measurements from one device to another. A pitot tube or velocity pressure device usually has a K factor of 4,005 times the square root of the velocity pressure. An amplified velocity pressure device has a K factor that is much less than 4,005, and that's the amplification. <clears throat> Thermal dispersion uh, has two variable resistance thermistors. Electronic mass airflow uh, is similar to thermal dispersion, but is typically a hot wire or a hot film anemometer. Uh, vortex shedding is another electronic type of measurement using a bluff body to generate eddies in the airflow and then counting those pulses. Uh, Doppler radar, like this speed trap on the freeway, it requires particles in the airflow and measures the speed of that air using radar, but that's outside of the scope of today's presentation. Airflow measurement in HVAC systems can take on many different forms and shapes depending on the velocities and where it's intended to be installed in the system. When we're talking about airflow measurement methods, multiple methods of airflow measurement exist, each with its own advantage and disadvantage. The goal is to match the proper method to the application given the space limitations. Placement is always what drives accuracy. And as Ray said, a very good air measurement station uh, placed in a bad location will not work as well as it could, but more sensors can make it better. Ray talked about placement considerations for the accuracy of the air measurement and turning vanes. <clears throat> turning vanes, radius elbows are really good things and anything that reduces system pressure drop uh, also reduces corresponding fan energy and makes the air measurement possible in less space. The example here was unveined elbows, which need five duct diameters upstream and one duct diameter downstream for a total of six duct diameters between elbows. Uh, that could be reduced to as little as one and a half duct diameters with the addition of simple turning vanes. It's a win-win. Turning vanes lower fan energy and system pressure drop for the life of the building and provides a greater number of options or places in the building where air measurement can be installed uh, in less space. An orifice plate is just a hole of a known size uh, added to the duct or to the opening to restrict the airflow. Ruskin has the VFBD35 iris damper and it works on this principle. We measure the pressure drop created by this known restriction to the airflow and the pressure drop varies by the square of the velocity. An orifice plate or expanded metal grate sometimes is placed into the airstream and all the air is forced through this restriction and the pressure drop is measured upstream and downstream uh, from this restriction and can be turned into an airflow measurement. A louver or opening can be undersized to restrict the airflow. Sometimes we see a screen or again, an expanded metal plate added to restrict the airflow to create sufficient pressure drop so that the airflows can be measured at lower flows. The advantage is that it's a simple, low cost solution, just a couple of pressure pickups and maybe a screen or expanded metal plate. The disadvantage is, is that it's a higher pressure drop uh, is required for it to work well, and it eats up fan energy, especially during the econ or free cooling mode. Uh, it requires field calibration generally to establish the pressure drop to flow relationship. Uh, spa, small velocity range for the product, uh, typically a four to one turndown ratio. Um, and a turndown ratio four to one means that a pressure drop uh, that is sufficient to measure airflow around 150 feet per minute uh, could then measure four times that amount or maybe 600 feet per minute uh, at the max that the pressure transducer can measure. And this would be a 25% outside air requirement. An instrumented, instrumented fan inlet cone uses a pressure difference between two planes of the fan's inlet. Uh, it typically has four pressure taps for each of two planes of the fan's inlet. 
The fan is the highest velocity point in the system and is sucking airflow through the fan's inlet. The high pressure point is upstream from the fan on the inlet bell and the low pressure point is at the inlet near the smallest diameter point in the fan's uh, inlet throat. Uh, two physometric rings are uh, typically uh, connected. Uh, for, there's four pressure, tra four pressure taps on the inlet bell. It numerically, uh, pneumatically averages those readings uh, for the high pressure port and another four sensors or ports for the low pressure and the difference between the high and the low is the pressure drop through the fan. The inlet cone uh, calibration or the fan's K factor is established experimentally by test and is provided by the fan manufacturer. The advantage again is that you have a factory calibrated air measurement station. It's simple just dealing with pressure drop across the fan. It's an AMCA approved air measurement method with no energy penalty. The disadvantage is, is that it may require field calibration to compensate for system effects when the fan is installed in less than ideal conditions. Pitot tube is another method of measuring air velocity. Air traveling at a specific velocity will create a velocity pressure. Velocity in feet per minute is determined by multiplying 4,005 times the square root of the velocity pressure. Velocity pressure cannot be measured directly as just one pressure point. It's the difference between two pressures. Air confined within an enclosed, enclosed space creates static pressure in all directions. Total pressure is the sum of velocity pressure plus the static pressure. Solving for velocity pressure or taking the difference between total pressure and static pressure, we get Velocity pressure is equal to total pressure minus static pressure. A pitot tube is an L-shaped sensor that can be inserted through a hole in the duct. It might have two pickup and one probe, or sometimes it's two probes, to read the total pressure uh, on the end of the pitot tube that faces into the airstream, and that would be the high pressure pickup point. The second or lower pressure static pressure pickup point is perpendicular to the airflow. You might see an L-shaped probe. You might have seen an L-shaped probe sticking out of the side of an airplane's fuselage, and this is often used to indicate airspeed on an airplane. The advantages are is that it's simple, uh, low-cost device. It's more tolerant of dirty environments when used with a deadhead transducer. It's easy to use and understand, and it's typically used in handheld duct velocity instruments. The disadvantages are that it's a relatively high minimum velocity that it can read. It's a, with a flow through transducer, it may plug up in dirty air. Um, the accuracy is associated with the low pressure transducer that it's applied with and typically a, a limited turndown ratio. An amplified velocity pressure device is very similar to a pitot pickup device. The sensor's shape determines the amplification factor. Amplification allows for reading lower velocities. A velocity <clears throat> is equal to the K factor times the square root of the velocity pressure. And if you look at the K factor, it's equal to the velocity at one inch of water column because the square root of one is one. And so this simplifies to just simply velocity is equal to K at one inch of water column. This is an example of a amplified velocity pressure device paired with the RU-274 low pressure transducer. The advantages are relatively low cost, the ability to read lower velocities, generally as low as 250 feet per minute using some amplified velocity pressure devices. It's a rugged, simple device uh, typically used in duct mounted applications, VAV box applications, and energy sucking aftermarket fan inlet probe applications. The disadvantage is, is that non-linear velocity pressure output sometimes, a limited turndown ratio, and again, the accuracy is associated with the transducer that it's paired with. Electronic thermal sensing uh, is measurement of airflow across a um, heated thermistor 
or a hot wire or a thin film uh, that dissipates heat. The energy dissipated from the heated sensor is measured and corrected for the ambient temperature to arrive at the velocity of the air movement. Uh, in thermal dispersion, we have a heated and passive thermistor pair that makes up a sensing point. Uh, more heat is dissipated at higher velocities or lower temperatures. The passive thermistor corrects for changes in temperature. The resulting change in heat dissipated is a direct function of the velocity of the air passing over the heated thermistor. Thermal sensing electronic type measurement is the method used in various Ruskin air measurement products. Electronic air measurement is so sensitive that air movement is all that's required to get a reading. Where a velocity pressure measurement device requires an air velocity to generate a velocity pressure that can be consistently measured, electronic air measurement just requires air movement. Electronic air measurement, therefore, is applied at lower velocities. Our state-of-the-art product is the TDP-05K Advanced Thermal Dispersion Air Measurement System. <clears throat> the TDP-05K and the DART uh, use thermal dispersion and mass airflow technology, respectively. Both are designed to work in ducts for low velocity measurement. The DART is designed for small ducts up to 16 inches round or 16 inches high. And the EFAMS is our fan inlet measurement device and is very different from any other fan inlet air measurement device on the market today with less energy penalty than other add-on aftermarket fan inlet devices. The Advanced Thermal Dispersion Air Measurement System is our second generation thermal dispersion air measurement product. The electronic air measurement probe is easier to retrofit into almost any application and can measure very low velocities. Our state-of-the-art product is, is, as I mentioned, the TDP-05K, and it uses surface mount therm thermistors, replacing our first generation's fragile bead and glass sensors. And it's designed to work in ductwork or outside air openings, uh, places that have these <coughs> low velocity requirements. The unit shown here does not require a separate transmitter box. We have a primary that replaces the transmitter box. The primary can be located on the end of the probe as shown here, or supplied as remote wired primary and installed up to 500 feet away from the air measurement station's location. Thermal sensing is another electronic air measurement method. The hot wire or hot film anemometer is a thin structured metallic resistive film or heater on a substrate. Energy is applied to the heater, elevating that temperature slightly above ambient. A Wheatstone bridge circuit compensates for the ambient temperature and maintains a fixed differential temperature and the energy required for the heater is measured very precisely to arrive at the air velocity. It's calibrated and the airflow is then expressed as the product of a fourth order polynomial. Electronic mass airflow sensors like the Ruskin Dart is designed for small duct 16 inches high or 16 inches in diameter and is a single point temperature and velocity air measurement device. The advantages are it's easy to install, it's accurate at low flow rates, and the analog output signal is linear. The disadvantages are that something like a hot wire anemometer are less durable than a hot film device. Probes are often installed in less than ideal locations. <clears throat> Some sensors are more susceptible to dirt and fouling and uh, there's a slightly higher cost associated with complex electronics. <clears throat> and this is typically applied in low velocity, small duct applications. Another method is vortex shedding. And this is another type of electronic airflow measurement. <clears throat> with vortex shedding, an obstruction is placed in the fluid flow and that obstruction creates eddies. Eddies are shed alternately on each side of the obstructing body and the eddies create pulses or pr pressure pulses. The frequency of these pulses is proportional to the velocity and the shedding frequency is how they arrive at the velocity of the fluid and air of course is a fluid. The advantages are that we have an analog output with 
a signal that is linear to flow. It's not affected by temperature and humidity, and it's not affected by dirt. The disadvantages are the higher cost associated with complex electronics and a relatively high uh, minimum velocity of 400 feet per minute. And it's typically used for dirty environments and it is frequently apl applied in, in liquid uh, wet applications. Orifice plate is a fixed opening where pressure drop across the opening is measured. Uh, pitot is for higher velocity applications with a K factor is 4005. Amplified velocity pressure can read lower flows and the K factor is much less than 4005. Mass airflow sensing is a hot wire or a hot film anemometer is typically a single point pickup where thermal dispersion technology has a number of, <clears throat> number of sensors and probes uh, spread out across the opening. And vortex shedding has a bluff body in the airstream and a microphone to pick up those pulses in the airflow caused by the bluff body. Some of these methods work better than others for outside air measurement applications, and whatever method is used, the amount of outside air needs to be measured and controlled to make sure that the minimum outside air required by building, con building codes is being maintained. In many commercial buildings, we have a building automation system to actively control the amount of outside air that's introduced into the building when occupied. That system maintains recommended minimum outside airflow and now during this pandemic needs to be cranked up to the extent possible. A factory calibrated device is usually more accurate and predictable and is often easier to install and integrate. The benefit of these devices is that an owner, applications engineer can easily verify document compliance. Any lead building requires outside air measurement. The outside air damper needs to automatically adjust to maintain the outside air rate and especially with the variable air volume system. Uh, the outside air damper cannot be left at some fixed opening when the amount of supply air changes based on temperature in the space. The outside air required is not a function of temperature, but is driven by the number of people in the space and the building component, as Spencer mentioned. Air measurement probes are the easiest to be retrofitted into existing systems. We have two different placement guidelines, one for velocity pressure and the other for electronic placement. They're slightly different, but in general, more upstream downstream spacing is always better. In normal times, energy savings are possible by only bringing in outside air when the building is occupied. <clears throat> one of AMCA's recommended strategies to help keep our commercial buildings safe is to purge the building uh, air overnight and to start each day with, with fresh air in the building. Uh, depending on the heating and cooling capacity of your system, it may be necessary to run the system 24 seven to accomplish this change out overnight. Right now, we know that being outside is healthier than being inside, but by bringing in more outside air, it's also, it's also possible to make any building a healthier, safer environment with the introduction of greater amounts of outside air. As a building owner or as an occupant in your building, it's critical to make sure your building is bringing in the right amount, the maximum amount of outside air. So that brings me to outside air measurement applications. Ray explained prevailing wind speeds nationally run around 11 miles per hour or right at 969 feet a minute. Outside air openings are sized rule of thumb at 500 feet per minute at 100% outside air. And with a 20% outside air requirement, that means we only have 100 feet per minute velocity through the opening when it's been sized for 100% at 500 feet per minute. Very little space is available upstream from the outside air damper for air measurement. Return air is often pointed at the outside air opening to promote mixing, which can play hell with air measurement if the velocities are highly divergent. An ideal air measurement device would be able to be installed in minimum space. It would be unaffected by turbulence Rain and dirt would not bother it, and it would be able to read air flows as low as zero feet per minute when required. So we have lots of ways to measure outside air at the source. A louver using differential pressure sensing behind the louver only works for dedicated outside air intakes with a sustained velocity greater than 300 feet per minute. Traditional velocity pressure probes work well 
when the opening is divided into a min and a max opening and each is sized for its expected range of airflows. Thermal dispersion technology is very sensitive to air movement and will measure air traveling in or out or just around in the area where the sensors are installed. Uh, damper airflow sensor combinations like our Airflow IQ, AMS 050 and IQ 50X are all example of dampers with air measurement combinations. With uh, measurement integral to louver blades, that would be our AML3 and AML6 wind-driven rain louvers, and they work extremely well. And then measurement integral to louver with a damper to control the airflow is also a combination that's available from Ruskin where we put dampers in sleeves with the louver. This is what a louver equipped with a differential pressure transmitter looks like. The advantages of this solution is that it solves the lack of space for air measurement station to be installed, <clears throat> the easy to retrofit into existing systems and to tie into a building automation system. The disadvantages are that it has a poor signal to noise ratio, low velocity equals a very small pressure drop and decreased accuracy and makes it susceptible to wind pressure, which I'll explain in the next slide. It can't be used when multiple air handlers draw from a common air intake and added pressure drop with the addition of screens or expanded metal plates increases fan energy cost, especially when operating in economizer or free cooling mode. Prevailing wind speeds and wind gusts create the noise on top of the louver's differential pressure measurement. When operating at minimum required air flows, the pressure drop across the louver is very small. The prevailing wind speeds can generate noise that is many times the value being measured. The Ruskin IEQ50X device is the device of choice for many original equipment manufacturers. Unlike the pressure drop that must be added in the form of a screen or expanded metal plates for the louver, the IEQ50X variable air measurement solution um, uses uh, damper position feedback from the actuator to know what the area is and then matches that information with a calibrated pressure drop across the outside air damper. The variable area means that we have lower pressure drop at higher flows like during free cooling and economizer mode and lower pressure drop over a wider range of air flows saves energy. The air measurement and damper combination is only 11 inches deep in the direction of airflow. The disadvantages here is that if you know that you need outside air measurement, you need to order it with your air handler and have it installed at the factory. It can't be retrofitted as easily as just adding some air measurement probes. The combination air measurement and outside air damper replaces a typical outside air damper. The advantages are that the air measurement and CFM set point flow control is included with the package. It's an aluminum low leak damper combined with five inch deep honeycomb air straightener section that doubles as the bird screen. At the lowest air flows, when the damper is controlling to the minimum air flows required, the damper has its greatest pressure drop. In fact, when it's closed, all the pressure drop takes place across a closed damper. Because of the way this works, it's less susceptible to wind conditions. The other feature that makes this desire, desirable for hospitals and other institutions is that lint buildup does not change the air measurement over time. That's not the case when using thermal dispersion electronic air measurement where lint insulates the sensors and causes the airflow to be underreported, resulting in ever increasing amounts of outside air being drawn into the building until the sensors are cleaned again. The biggest issue with velocity pressure probes are that when, <clears throat> when required minimum air flows are less than what was intended when the unit was ordered, um, Oftentimes, we get to the site during the startup phase and the building is lightly occupied or someone has determined that it's that that less than the intended air flows are what they want to measure. When velocity pressure is sized correctly, it is every bit as accurate as electronic air measurement and can be much less expensive. Some manufacturers combine very high accuracy transmitters with signal processors to marry the me to measure these very, very low velocity pressures that are in the thousandths of an inch of water column, where velocity pressures uh, 
that's the what the velocity pressures would be at airflows less than 300 feet per minute, less than one one hundredth of an inch of water column. Unstable air measurement is an indication of turbulent airflow or air passing in two directions through the plane of the air measurement station. Electronic thermal dispersion multi-sensor arrays average a number of electronic sensors and more sensing points, as we've pointed out, can make a bad location better. Multi-sensors array with some number of probes are combined to make an air measurement station. We average those electronic signals to arrive at the average velocity through the opening very, very accurately. When the airflow through the plane of the air measurement station is highly divergent, more sensing points can help. It's always better to place the air measurement station at the correct location in the system with the correct upstream and downstream spacing, but when that's not possible, more sensors on the probe or more probes in the opening uh, can help. We've already talked about our variable area IQ50X combination unit earlier. Uh, these are some of our other velocity pressure air measurement stations combined with the control damper in one assembly that are installed as one unit. Air always exits through the damper section. That makes these units uh, that we're looking at all air in the face. The air measurement takes place upstream from the modulating control damper. The Ruskin AMS 050 is our top selling air measurement station for rectangular duct installations and is a staple for every controls contractor. The building automation system reads the velocity pressure from the air measurement station and modulates the damper to control the airflow that's required. The round air measurement station in the top right <clears throat> has become the basis of design for new grow operation and is our airflow IQ. This uses the Ruskin air measurement actuator as the controller and backnet interface point. The actuator on the CDRMS damper maintains last command signal on power loss, so the ventilation air for the crop and uh, the ideal airflow can be restored as quickly as possible when power returns. The air measurement actuator reads the velocity pressure from the low pressure transducer and controls the position of the damper to maintain the required airflow. The set point can be commanded via its BACnet MSTP or BACnet IP or an analog 0 to 10 volt input. This same actuator can be used on the AMS 050 product to provide air measurement with controls. The benefit of this actuator, actuator is lots of information, including trending and damper position and set point control is all available via a two-wire network interface. The combination of a damper with an air measurement station and controller in one unit is something Ruskin does best as our airflow IQ. Any Ruskin control damper can be combined with our advanced thermal dispersion air measurement probes in a 15-inch sleeve and a modulating actuator that can be controlled by others. Or by selecting the Ruskin air measurement actuator, it becomes air measurement with controls from Ruskin. A full range of airflows are possible depending on the application, supply, return, outside air, or exhaust. CFM set point is input via the BACnet interface, as I mentioned before. Airflow measurement is directly from the air measurement device or read as a BACnet point uh, by, the, by the building automation system. Electronic air measurement can control airflow as low as 100 feet per minute. Velocity pressure can control airflows as low as, low as 300 feet per minute and either can work up to velocities as high as 5,000 feet per minute. When paired with our CD50 damper, this is a low leak class 1A damper with less than 300, pardon me, with less than three CFM per square foot leakage at one inch of water column. We have optional features like stainless steel bearings, stainless steel linkage. We can also build the same thing with a galvanized damper or stainless steel damper or aluminum dampers. So all those dampers, are possible and we recommend a pose blade damper for outside air applications to get the best control at the lowest flows. Our air measurement louver are the ideal solution for combining the performance of Ruskin's AML3 wind driven rain louvers with a product to get a product that's only four inches deep in the direction of airflow. So louver air measurement station only four inches. Um, it can also be combined with our AML6 air measurement product, and that combined unit is seven inches deep in the direction of airflow. Um, either unit needs to be installed with at least four inches of space between the louver 
and the damper behind it. So this is a perfect solution for free area velocities of 345 feet per minute to 2024 feet per minute, rejecting up to 99% uh, of entrained moisture in the airstream with eight inches of rain falling per hour and a 50 mile an hour breeze hitting the louver. It's an amazing air measurement station also with plus or minus 3% accuracy and lower pressure drop than other solutions. CR leads online louver selection tool to size the airflow that's needed for your application. When installed in place of an outside air intake louver, the AML3 would stick out only eight inches from the side of the uh, rooftop unit or AHU unit. Air measurement louver combined with a control damper and a controller in one package would get you modulating actuator with controls, back net interface, and all the features of our Airflow IQ. So that brings us back to where we started. Selecting the right product for the application can make all the difference between a successful project and one that runs off the rails. Ruskin has more ways of measuring air than any other manufacturer. Ruskin's been making air measurement equipment since the mid 1990s. Today, our advanced thermal dispersion air measurement system far exceeds the features found on other vendors' legacy products. Contact your local Ruskin sales representative for help selecting the correct product for your project and don't settle for a one-size-fits-all fit all approach. Electronic or properly sized velocity pressure air measurement devices can be equally accurate and in general, electronic works best for lower velocities and larger openings. Velocity pressure or electronic air measurement can be applied uh, for higher velocity applications. Any air measurement station needs to be properly sized for its intended range of airflows. When that work is done at the beginning of the project, a velocity pressure solution is often less expensive, more reliable, and can be installed as part of the duct work or supplied with the air handling unit. When air measurement is left to the end of the project and given to the controls contractor to implement, then we're usually looking at the electronic air measurement product like the advanced thermal dispersion air measurement system, the TDP 05K. I wanna thank you all for using and specifying Ruskin products. I'll turn it over right now to Spencer. Thank you. Good stuff, Glenn. Uh, we've covered a lot of information today, so we want to highlight just a few items uh, so that you can tackle your next airflow measurement product. So first off, it's always important to maintain control of your ventilation rates, and it's even required by code. Uh, the solution to pollution is dilution. So the more air you can get into your space, uh, the better chance you have of maintaining proper uh, indoor air quality. There's not a one size fits all approach for every airflow measurement application as we have uh, discussed today. In fact, designs with adequate duct spacing are the best way to assure accurate measurements. However, more sensors can make any bad location better. Air measuring system systems can be either velocity pressure or electronic type. Uh, both for the velocity pressure and the electronic system possess their own advantages and disadvantages, uh, and these should be taken into consideration during your design. Consider matching the type of measurement device to the application and your space available. And air measurement with integrated control dampers, such as the Airflow IQ, uh, allows for compact air control. With that, thank you so much. We are going to do a short question and answer session uh, led by Tessa. Thanks, Spencer. Our Q&A session is now open. Please use the box on the upper right side of your screen to submit any questions you may have. We will respond to all questions we don't get to in an email following the conclusion of this webinar. If you have any further questions after the meeting concludes, please feel free to contact Emma Barnhart. So it looks like our first question might be for Spencer here. So it's, isn't electronic air measurement always more accurate? Which air measurement device should I use? Good question. So there is a perception that electronic air measuring is gonna always be the most accurate because of the highly uh, technical and detailed thermistors that are used. But, but actually for, for high velocity airflow situations, velocity pressure, uh, systems can be just as accurate as electronic. I think electronic air measuring systems do provide more accurate measurement at lower air velocities. Uh, but what I would recommend to anyone out there that, that comes across a question like this, uh, we do have, Ruskin has a full team of people 
uh, readily available to help with application specific questions such as this. And do not hesitate to reach out to your Ruskin representative um, to throw a question by them and, and we'd be happy to get you an answer uh, for your specific facility. Right, thanks Spencer. So our next question is, you stated that velocity pressure was more tolerant to dirt in the airstream. I have always been told that velocity pressure is less tolerant of dirt. Which is it? Glenn, I think this might be for you. Right. Um, as I tried to point out in my presentation, um, Ruskin only uses a, a deadhead transducer. So all of our devices have a diaphragm in them and no air flows through them from the uh, high pressure port to the low pressure port. So the RU274, R2 VDC, the AMS8100 LR, and the DPT IQ uh, are all deadhead type transducers and no air gets into the inside of the device uh, or goes through device. Right, all right, thanks. So our next question is, during your presentation, you stated that air measurement probes could be retrofitted into existing hoods to measure outside airflow. However, your installation guide guidelines show that a 12 inch sleeve is required. Can you please clarify if the sleeve is required or is it optional? Ray, I think this one is for you. Yeah, so you never technically have to get a sleeve from us. Every installation is a little bit different. You do need the sleeve to meet our uh, installation guidelines. But the reason for that is because the sleeve there actually helps you uh, ensure that it's not going to be as affected by wind, basically. So there's reasons behind and all behind everything in our installation guidelines. But since everything is unique, it's best to just try to reach out to us for any different situation that you have or any weird installations. And we'll always try to help you out here. Right. All right. Thanks, Ray. So it looks like our last question is, how much outside air should we be bringing into our building during this pandemic? Yeah, I'll start that one, Tessa. Uh, the short answer for that is as much air as possible, or at least as much as your uh, HVAC system can handle, uh, given that the solution to pollution is dilution. Uh, in this COVID uh, crisis that we're going through, we want to we want to get out as much of that recirculating air of the building as possible, and so really um, try to ventilate as much fresh air in your building as you can. And uh, Spencer, I'll just add on to that. Uh, two weeks ago, we did a um, webinar on uh, considerations also, and you can uh, still access as a recording. Uh, but uh, it's important to keep your humidity under control as well. Um, you know, between 40 and 60 percent uh, indoor humidity is um, is important, as well as uh, try keeping the, the temperature under control. So that's 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 critical. And then uh, we pointed out in the previous presentation how to accomplish that using uh, energy recovery ventilators and uh, filtration, all all things that can help make your buildings safer. Right. All right. Thanks. So it looks like that's all the time we have for questions today, and we thank you all for attending the webinar. We will be sending out an email after the meeting concludes with responses to questions, certificates of attendance, and a link to next week's webinar registration. That being said, please join us next week on September 9th at 1 p.m. Central Time for a discussion on louver products. Thank you again for attending, and we hope you all have a wonderful day.